In 1969, a meeting of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO, proposed that an American Population Commission be created with a, quote, large budget for propaganda, unquote. Four months later, Republican President Richard Nixon signed legislation establishing the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future. The bill authorizing this new initiative had been passed with overwhelming support from congressional Democrats and was chaired by John Rockefeller. The executive director of the project was to be Dr. Charles F. Westhoff, who was also a member of both the American Eugenics Society and Planned Parenthood's National Advisory Council. Another member of this new commission was Dr. Joseph Beasley. In the 1960s, Beasley oversaw an aggressive eugenics program that concentrated on black neighborhoods in New Orleans with the stated intention of lowering welfare costs. This project would eventually be described by Planned Parenthood President Alan Guttmacher as the number one success story in the history of American birth control movement. It also led to Beasley being elected chairman of the board of Planned Parenthood in 1970. Then in 1975, Beasley was sent to federal prison for conspiring to defraud the U.S. government of $778,000 that had been allocated for the project. In court, a local black civil rights activist named Sherman Copeland testified that he took payoffs from Beasley for helping him to convince residents of the targeted neighborhoods that birth control was not black genocide. In 1969, William H. Draper was appointed to represent the United States on the United Nations Population Commission. Draper had once proposed that government-sponsored population control efforts among the poor be accelerated in order to deal with racial unrest and to cure what he called the ghetto problem. Draper was on the governing body of Planned Parenthood and had personally raised more than $4 million for the organization. That same year, a New York Times article about Planned Parenthood said the organization's board of directors was dominated by people who were both white and wealthy. The article went on to quote one of those board members as saying, what it all comes down to is that we want the poor to stop breeding while we retain our freedom to have large families. It's strictly a class point of view. There's ample evidence that government programs designed for poor black folks emphasize birth control and abortion availability, both measures obviously designed to limit black population. Median Dick Gregory, Ebony Magazine, 1971. It takes little imagination to see that the unborn black baby is the real object of many abortionists. Irma Clardy Craven, Chairman, Minneapolis Commission on Human Rights and Secretary of the Urban League. It was not until the mid-60s that blacks began to realize that what was called urban renewal was in fact what one black city planner labeled Negro removal. Roy Ennis, National Director of the Congress of Racial Equality, Ebony Magazine, 1974. To a large and growing number of 1960s civil rights activists, it became obvious that family planning was just a code word for abortion and birth control, and that it was being pushed by the government as a way to avoid putting money into the black community. This conclusion was reinforced by statements like those of Democratic President Lyndon B. Johnson, who in June of 1965 stated that every five dollars the government spent on population control was worth more than a hundred dollars invested in economic growth. Then, at the urging of Republican Congressman George Bush, Johnson became the first U.S. president to endorse federal funding for birth control. In 1966, he would also accept Planned Parenthood's highest award for his policies, pushing family planning on foreign countries. It was at about this same time that political leaders from both parties began to increase their demands that aid to the poor, whether abroad or within the United States, be tied to birth control. In 1965, former Republican President Dwight Eisenhower complained that the United States was spending money to slow the population growth of responsible families, while at the same time providing financial incentives for ignorant, feeble-minded, and lazy people to have more babies. He said that history would rightly condemn the United States if we didn't link welfare to family planning. 
At that time, Eisenhower was the co-chairman of a Planned Parenthood fundraising campaign along with former Democratic President Harry S. Truman. John Ehrlichman, who was an assistant to President Richard Nixon, wrote that Nixon once told him that African Americans could not really benefit from federal programs because they are genetically inferior to whites. Later, Nixon would label birth control a national priority and sign legislation to make it available as a service of the U.S. government. Then, in March of 1972, the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future, which Nixon had created three years earlier with the help of congressional Democrats, began calling for the nationwide legalization of abortion. The concept that abortion and birth control could be used to save the government money was well established by this point in history. In 1969, Joseph Kershaw, who was a researcher with the U.S. government's Office of Economic Opportunity, stated that the agency had closely studied the poverty issue and found that the single most cost-effective way for the government to address it was through family planning. In other words, through abortion and birth control. And that sort of thinking is still very much alive today. On January 25, 2009, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, said on an ABC News program that the government's economic stimulus package should include a large increase in spending for population control. She said that this could save the state and federal governments the cost of having to pay for the health care and education of poor children. Not surprisingly, Pelosi has a 100 percent approval rating from Planned Parenthood. At one time, it was common to hear politicians and elected officials openly talking about the need for population control in the black community or saying things like uh, $1 spent on family planning is worth $5 spent on economic development. But since we don't hear that sort of thing anymore, it would be easy to conclude that the government is not still involved in black genocide, but that's not the case. Look, it's no longer necessary for the government to be directly involved in black genocide because that's what they hired Planned Parenthood for. I mean, it can't just be a coincidence that at the same time when government population control programs were backing away from specifically targeting black neighborhoods, at that same time, the state and federal funding for Planned Parenthood was being increased by leaps and bounds. To understand the magnitude of the dollars involved here, remember this. By 1970, Planned Parenthood was already the 19th largest health-related fundraising organization in the country. But by year 2000, it had moved into third place behind only the American Heart Association and the American Cancer Society. And a major factor in that phenomenal growth was government funding. Basically, what's happened over the last 40 years or so is that Planned Parenthood has taken billions in government money while locating the vast majority of its facilities in minority neighborhoods. And that has not only been a tremendous boost for the eugenics movement, but it has also allowed government-funded family planning programs to target the black population while insulating the government from any direct connection to black genocide. One of the places where government money has been used to advance the eugenics agenda has been in the public school system. Although government-funded population control programs can be found in white schools, the evidence is that they are significantly more likely to be targeted at black schools. One example of this was seen in 1986, when it was discovered that Illinois public schools were not only distributing birth control to children, but that every one of the 50 facilities involved were in minority neighborhoods. When this information was made public, a local African-American pastor organized a campaign to stop the program. Reverend Hiram Crawford labeled the project genocide, saying that the obvious goal was to go after the Hispanic and black population. That same pattern was also found in Maryland in the 1990s. Even though the state's teen pregnancy rate was higher among white students than black students, when the contraceptive device Norplant was introduced, it was selectively marketed to children as young as 13 in predominantly black schools in Baltimore. The result was that of the first 350 girls implanted at a local middle school, 345 were African American. 
Then, when Norplant was approved for general distribution, of the first 100 schools selected, all 100 were in minority neighborhoods. The Norplant contraception device was developed by the Population Council in New York, which had been established in 1952 under the leadership of its president, John Rockefeller. Its next two presidents, Frederick Osborne and Frank Notstein, were both former members of the American Eugenics Society and Notstein would later serve on the National Advisory Council of Planned Parenthood.